The Model F keyboard, if properly set up and maintained, can provide you with decades of pure typing pleasure and performance. And it can hopefully be something you will use for the rest of your lifetime and maybe pass down to future generations. This video will review everything you need to know about setting up your brand new Model F keyboard. The Model F keyboard is a robust design. Every part is 100% user replaceable or user repairable, often needing just a couple tools, screwdrivers, tweezers, pliers, and at most a soldering iron. If you are unable to solve an issue after you have reviewed the manual, both the written manual and this video, please direct all questions and support requests to the project thread on the mechanical keyboard forums such as Deskthority. Please do not email me or post on the Q&A page for technical support. The great communities of mechanical keyboard fans on sites like Deskthority, GeekHack, and Reddit are great at sorting out all types of issues. You will never be out of reach of someone who can offer you advice and help in the coming years. The new Model F project philosophy is for users to be able to fix small issues themselves due to the simplicity and full repairability of the Model F design. There are two essential requirements to help your Model F keyboard last a long time. Educating yourself on how to set up and maintain your keyboard, and also making sure you have plenty of spare parts on hand now so that they will be available to you long after production has shut down and this project has ended. Buying spare parts is essential to help keep your keyboard operational in the decades to come. Please check out all the other items in the store. The most important extras are the first aid kit of spare parts for future keyboard repairs once production has long shut down. Spare flippers with springs, spare barrels, key pullers, extra key sets because the key tops do wear down over time, and also a spare custom made 3 meter USB cable. I hope to be able to manufacture as many first aid kits and spare parts as possible to keep all these great Model F keyboards running decades from now. If you like using Model F and Model M buckling spring keyboards, the best way to help the project is to tell other tech-minded people you know about the project. And now let's get started. First up are the safety precautions. Always consult the booklet included with your new Model F keyboard for safety precautions, limited warranty information, and other important information. Severe harm or even death can occur with any product if safety precautions are not followed. Model F Labs does not condone using these heavy, solid metal keyboards as weapons of defense in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Only use the USB cable that came with the keyboard. Now let's go on to parts identification. First up, here are the keys and the key colors from left to right. Pebble, Pearl, Black, Industrial SSK Blue, and Dark Gray. Here's a picture of the barrel. This is where the keys are inserted into. Next up is the flipper with the spring. Then we have the top inner assembly and the bottom inner assembly. We have some inner foam, the controller PCB with its ribbon cable, and the large capacitive PCB. Here are the top and bottom parts of the case and some optional add-ons, the solenoid and solenoid driver. Okay, now we're on to initial setup. Please study this entire section and go through everything step by step. Otherwise, you'll miss something and it could cost you hours of time to fix it and you may even need to start over completely. First up, after your keyboard arrives in the mail, inspect the keyboard's flippers, springs, and layout. Make sure you received everything you ordered and that nothing is damaged. Part of a keycap may have snapped off in shipping. Check all the various bags as parts may be mixed inside other bags. Before installing any keys, Make sure all springs on their flippers are present and move freely. A stuck flipper might require taking apart the keyboard if it cannot be loosened from the top side of the keyboard. If you have to open up and slide apart the keyboard's inner assembly plates, be sure to remove the keys first. If you see a flipper nub without a spring, the spring may have fallen off in shipping and needs to be replaced. Refer to the key installation section coming up for details and then come back here. You may notice some barrels without any flippers and springs. This is intentional with the Model F design. The extra wide keys, 2U and wider, have stabilizer inserts which go inside these barrels. It is best to use new Model F stabilizer inserts with new Model F project keys and other stabilizer inserts with other keys. It is also important to make sure the layout you ordered is the layout you received. For key sets with full size left and right shift keys, there should be no flipper and spring 
in the right barrel of the left shift and nothing in the left barrel of the right shift. For standard horizontal enter, for example, US layout, and 2U backspace keys as well, there should be no flipper in the left barrel. For ISO enter, there should be no flipper in the top barrel of that key. If your layout is not the one you wanted, head over now to the section on opening the inner assembly. It's easy to change it if you haven't skipped ahead to installing the keys. It only takes a few minutes if the keys are not installed. The only thing you can't change is going between HHKB style split right shift and regular right shift. The next step is to install stabilizer inserts. Horizontal inserts, the white stabilizers, are used for the 2U and wider keys in the barrels that do not contain a flipper and spring, with exceptions for two keys. Vertical keys, such as the ISO enter key and 2U vertical key, which uses the black vertical stabilizer, and the spacebar, which does not use stabilizer inserts at all. You can't put an insert in a barrel if there is a flipper or spring in that barrel already. You'd have to open up the inner assembly to remove that flipper. Let's push the insert all the way into the barrel so that it is flush with the top of the barrel. Install horizontal inserts, the white inserts, as pictured here, with the ears on the left and right sides. The vertical stabilizer inserts are installed also as pictured for the number pad 2U vertical keys, but must be installed differently for ISO enter. For ISO enter, you're going to rotate that insert so it matches the photo. For ISO enter, you wanna make sure that the larger ear of the insert is on the left. Whereas for the 2U vertical number pad keys, make sure that that larger ear is on the right side. If you mistakenly install the stabilizer incorrectly or install the incorrect stabilizer, you will need to take apart the keyboard to push out the stabilizer insert from the other side. An alternative to this would be to use straight tip lock ring or snap ring pliers, though not all of them would fit. There are also some other methods you might want to try out that do not involve taking apart the keyboard. Check out the description and the written manual for more details. Next up is getting the space bar right. Model F keyboard spacebars are highly adjustable, so you can dial in the kind of spacebar you want to some degree. This is a key you will be pressing a lot, so it's a good idea to get it right before proceeding, because it is trickier to adjust the spacebar after you have installed all the keys. Sometimes the spacebar requires adjustment after these keyboards are unfortunately bounced around in shipping. Sometimes they are bounced around so much that you have to reinstall the spacebar entirely. In general, Adjusting the spacebar is a matter of slightly bending the spacebar wire so it performs optimally, and maybe adjusting the tabs too. Definitely more of an art than a science. When the spacebar gets stuck in my QC process, I usually take the wire with two hands, with the long part of the wire closest to my thumbs, and use both thumbs to very slightly push up the wire. I do this a few times, but not too hard that the bend becomes noticeable. That way the wire is pushed out of the way enough of the metal stabilizer tabs so that there is a little room. If the stabilizer wire is too close to the back of the metal tabs, the wire can get in the way of normal spacebar operation. This will also make the spacebar wire ever so slightly wider in the two places where it connects to the spacebar itself. Check to make sure the spacebar wire is underneath the top of the metal tab for both tabs. You can tighten up the spacebar actuation and reduce rattle by removing the spacebar wire from the spacebar and tightening the left and right parts of the wire so that they are moved inwards, but not so much so that the bar cannot be reinstalled to the spacebar. If you need to separate the stabilizer wire from the spacebar, Always hold the spacebar upside down and make sure that the wire is flat against the spacebar. Then you can pull the spacebar wire from one end in order to separate it from its hole in the spacebar. Always remove the spacebar wire stabilizer from the spacebar wire before adjusting it. If you just try to pull the wire straight off or push on to the spacebar, you may break the spacebar's little tabs. The metallic twang or reverberation or ringing is definitely the sound I am going for, but there are ways of reducing it. One can also carefully push down the metal spacebar tabs for a reduction in the rattling sound. Always push the side of the spacebar wire whose tab you want to adjust towards the metal tab in order to get that wire nearly touching the back of the metal tab before you push down that tab. Then repeat for the other side. Pushing down these metal tabs may make the spacebar require heavier force to actuate. If you push these tabs down too much, the spacebar may get stuck frequently. And also, by pushing the spacebar wire down, 
it's a little more tricky to remove the spacebar. Some other methods to change the spacebar sound is by using electrical tape where the stabilizer meets the clips or applying heat shrink to the spacebar. Check out the written manual for more details. If the spacebar is not actuating, test with another key, like a 1U size key, to make sure the spring is good. If the 1U key works, then you can carefully remove and reseat the spacebar. This key's tabs are easily broken, so please be careful. For keyboards shipped in 2020 or earlier, if the spacebar gets stuck, push down a little on the metal tabs. The updated production rounds shortened the metal tab slightly to eliminate that issue of the tab end making contact with the spacebar. If your spacebar lags a bit, you just need to loosen the clips a touch with a screwdriver, or you may need to bend the stabilizer wire a bit. I believe that the nice spacebar thud sound and minimizing rattle is highly contingent on the proper placement of the metal tabs relative to the stabilizer wire. Bending the stabilizer wire slightly away from the metal tab ends results in a more rattly spacebar with a lighter actuation force that some people prefer, while pushing too much towards the metal tab ends can slightly increase actuation force for the spacebar. Excellent spacebar stability and sound is most likely to occur when the wire is directly against the back of the metal tab or very close to it. Another way of reducing the spacebar force slightly is to squeeze the stems of the key as described later on in the wiggle method section. Regarding squeaky spacebars, that is nearly always the case of adjusting or slightly stretching or replacing the spring rather than due to the spacebar stabilizer wire. A squeaking or stuck spacebar is often due to a bad spring combined with the need to slightly adjust the bend of the spacebar stabilizer wire. You can replace the spring without opening up the keyboard by using tweezers as shown later on. Spacebar seating issues. Likely the spacebar tabs have been pushed down too much or not enough, or the spacebar wire is bent out of shape. It should be precisely rectangular as a starting point. Also, the spacebar should be installed as shown, with the spacebar end up but a 40 degree angle. This is a little different from the keyboard angle when installing all the other keys. Okay, now we're ready to install the rest of the keycaps. Please do not plug in the keyboard to your computer until you're instructed to later on. The steps in this section will describe everything you need to know about how to install the keys, how to evaluate the sound of the spring as you test each key to make sure the key actuates properly when it is pressed, how to reduce the buzzing sound of a key, and or fix a key whose spring does not click or buckle as it is pressed down. It is completely normal for many keys not to function on your first try. Removing and reinstalling a non-working key a few dozen times is not the way to go about setting up your new Model F. Keep watching to avoid frustration and reduce your setup time. Proper key installation involves holding the keyboard vertically, spacebar side up. Don't let the keyboard rest horizontally until each key has fully been pressed in. Do not connect the keyboard to a computer until you have installed the keys. It is important to test the Model F before you start using it on your computer. Model F springs are often dislodged during shipping, which can result in a bad click sound or no click at all, and keys may need to be reseated. Now, we test each key to make sure it buckles properly. Follow this next part to see step-by-step -step how to fix a non-working key, as well as help you determine what key press sounds good versus what is a potential issue. The fix for each key takes less than one minute. You should not spend more time than that for each key. The last step is to replace the spring or switch it with another key's spring. Often springs may be damaged during installation, and once damaged, a spring may no longer be usable. The first keys you should install are the ones 2U and larger. Due to the design of buckling spring keycaps, these keys are most likely to become stuck when pressed all the way down and require following these steps to fix such instances of key binding. Here is the first method. You may have to do steps several times in some instances of binding. Follow these steps, install the key, and test with about 10 to 20 key presses. Remove and do all the steps again if needed. First. Gently pinch the affected key's outer stem or ear and stabilizer insert pole 
between your thumb and forefinger and wiggle side to side about 20 to 30 times. Your fingers should be positioned so as to squeeze deeply into the key, as deep as possible, not just at the very end of the key stem. After squeezing, gently wiggle the key post, the part that goes into the stabilizer insert, 10 times in the direction of the left and right sides of the key seems to mitigate binding when the extreme edges of a key are pressed. Be very gentle as this is the easiest part to break on a key. Do not touch the stabilizer insert itself or add any lubrication to it. If it is still stuck but maybe a little better, repeat the prior steps and test again. Sometimes the two wings or ears of the stem get stuck too close together so you have to gently spread them apart. Some folks have reported that the horizontal or white stabilizer insert works better with the vertical keys instead of the vertical or black insert. If the key is too loose and pops off, you just need to gently widen the stem a bit without breaking it. The stem consists of the two legs that go into the barrel. It's common for the larger key stems to be slightly too narrow or too wide. Please use the other keys stems for reference on the proper width. Other potential fixes are described in the manual. Sometimes unplugging the keyboard and plugging it back in after 15 minutes fixes a random issue you may be having. If the key doesn't press because the spring can't move, the flipper may be stuck. Remove the key. Do the flipper and spring move freely in the barrel if you flick it? Sometimes in chipping, the keyboard is jolted so much that the flipper gets stuck and can't move, and I have to carefully use tweezers to push the flipper back up into position to match the other flippers. Sometimes moving the flipper carefully with tweezers does the trick. Otherwise, you have to open up the keyboard to reposition the flipper. If you did not check that each flipper could move freely in the earlier steps, at this time you may have to take off all the keycaps to open up the inner assembly and get the flipper back into position. I recommend tightening the two controller screws that ground the controller, as they may have loosened as the keyboards are bounced around in shipping. If you see issues with holding down a modifier key and another key at the same time, or issues with key presses being out of sequence from what you typed when typing fast, fixing the grounding screws will likely solve this issue, and also adjusting the springs and replacing them may also fix the issue. Do not use the key press monitor part of the P. Andrew utility as it currently does not function correctly. If the spacebar is making contact with the keys above it, it is a matter of adjusting the shape of the spacebar stabilizer wire and maybe putting some scrap foam or other material between the spacebar stabilizer wire and the back of the metal tab so that the stabilizer is moved upwards a bit. The spacebar needs to be moved farther away from the key it is making contact with, and that can be done by bending the spacebar and or putting some material in the spacebar tab. Do not sand away parts of the keycap or do anything else on your own as it is unnecessary. Quote, putting a rectangular piece of cardstock vertically between the inner face of the tab and the wire did the trick, end quote, for one desk authority member. There is definitely a break-in period with Model F keyboards especially with the springs. There's a good chance that the springs will sound even better over time with usage. Also, pressing a key a number of times may fix an initially flaky key after adjusting the spring. Next up, we want to remove and reseat any loose or non-working keys. Regarding reseating springs, in nearly all cases, you do not need to take apart the keyboard to fix keys that do not click, nor do you need to spend a few minutes pressing a troublesome key. Reattach the key with the keyboard positioned as shown vertically with the spacebar row up. Often, reseating a key is not enough to make the key work or to reduce or eliminate a buzzing sound when the key is pressed, and you need to remove and reattach the spring. The tools you'll need include a wire key puller and tweezers. To remove your spacebar, the metal spacebar tabs may be pressed down, so be careful when pulling off the spacebar and its stabilizer wire. Then you want to pull off the wire as shown. If you pull down or push, it may break the spacebar's plastic tabs. Make sure the stabilizer wire is at a 90 degree bend on both sides to start out with. Slide one end in and carefully press the other side in so as not to break the plastic tab. The wire should rotate freely. Test each key one at a time. Press each key a few times. Remove keys that buzz or do not click properly. It is up to you to decide which keys sound good or bad. I recommend ordering extra springs and the first aid kit if you are as sensitive as I am to the sound of your keyboard. Make sure the stabilizer inserts are pressed down all the way so that they're flat with the top of the barrel.
This key is not installed properly. It does not click and will not send a signal to the computer when it is pressed. In most cases, just remove the key, orient the keyboard vertically, spacebar end up, and reinstall the key. Sometimes you just need to adjust the spring. First up, you want to try once or twice to remove and reseat the key. If this still produces buzzing or a non-working key, you'll have to go on to the next step, which is adjusting the spring. Hold the keyboard upright and gently tap so springs fall into place. Here are some steps if you're hearing buzz when you press a key. First, we stretch the spring and use tweezers to press the spring downwards. Use angled tweezers as shown to compress the spring perpendicular to the flipper. This will push the spring onto the nub of the flipper. Squeeze the tweezers and compress the spring several times. The goal is to get that spring pushed down far onto the nub of the flipper. That happened to fix the most salient issues of this example. The goal when reinstalling the spring is, one, to have the spring touch the 12 o'clock position of the barrel when the keyboard is positioned that way, and two, to have the end of the spring in the 12 o'clock position relative to the flipper. If the spring end is not positioned at 12 o'clock and the spring does not touch the barrel, buckling error is more likely to occur. Grip the base of the spring towards the flipper when gliding the spring. In this example, tweezers grip the spring a bit too high, which is not going to work. Second, if a key still buzzes, carefully removing and flipping the spring upside down can fix most spring issues. Twist off the spring counterclockwise, flip it upside down, and reinstall while keeping the top spring end at 12 o'clock always. When removing a spring, twist it counterclockwise. Never pull a string straight up. And third, if that doesn't work, Replace the spring. Replacing the spring with another spring is a last but often necessary step. This is a very important step because not all springs will work and some may have been damaged. But interestingly, that spring might work in another key. So there is no need to discard the spring. You may want to switch two keys springs around with each other and the swap may make both keys work. To reinstall a spring, use tweezers or a chopstick or small screwdriver with the end partially broken off. Before installing, make sure the end of the spring is in the 12 o'clock position. Make sure the spring is close to or touches the top of the barrel. Otherwise, the key may not work reliably. Sometimes, if a spring is too far away from that top of the barrel when the keyboard is held vertically, space bar end up, it may prevent you from installing a working key. So you can see that you can replace these springs without having to take apart the whole keyboard in most cases. And here is a typing test after adjusting all the springs. Now that all the keys are adjusted and you tested each key several times before this step, we are going to connect the keyboard to the computer for the first time. Do one more check before plugging in your keyboard. Be sure you can hear the snap of the flipper when pressing each and every key. I like to press each key a few times to be sure of a reliable actuation. If you are just feeling the pressure of a spring when a key is pressed, but without a snap, that means you have not installed the key properly, and many keys on the keyboard will not work due to the way a pressed key confuses the auto calibration when a keyboard is plugged in. Open a keyboard tester website. Be sure to plug the keyboard directly into the computer, not into a USB hub, and make sure there are no other connected USB devices besides the mouse, just for troubleshooting to check for conflicts. USB hubs can often cause problems with Model F keyboards. If the keyboard is not detected, check that the USB cable is plugged in fully on the controller end of the USB cable as well. If you see at Mega32 in your device manager for Windows, system information for Mac, or hard info on Linux, you may have accidentally cleared the firmware and need to reflash the firmware. See the advanced topics section to fix this. Also, try on another port and on another computer. Test each key with the keyboard tester website. 
refer to the product page for the factory default layout. For example, the right control key may be factory programmed as the function key. So when you press this key, it will not register as a control key, and it will appear that the key is broken. One less common issue you may find is inconsistent key registration. Double presses, key ghosting, keys not recognized, or key spamming, which is extra keys when one key is pressed. Double presses and other issues could be related to the two controller ground screws not being tight enough, or due to the seating of the spring on the flipper nub, or some kind of damage to the spring. The tops of the springs can get caught on something and bend out of shape. Spring damage can't be 100% fixed in my experience without replacing the spring itself. Or it could be an issue with the debounce filter and threshold. But these two are related to the older XWhatsit firmware, which stopped being used as the factory default in early 2020. Key registration issues are usually an issue with the way that the keys were installed. For example, if the keyboard wasn't held upright and each key tested for the proper click beforehand, that may be the cause. For example, you may see double presses if the spring is not properly reinstalled, especially if it is not pushed down all the way onto the flipper nub, or if the spring is not reinstalled with its end between 12 and one o'clock. Don't forget that one of the steps to fixing keys involves replacing the spring itself as shown earlier. When testing, always make sure the XWATSIT controller is attached to the bottom inner assembly plate with both ground screws. If after you have followed these instructions completely and many keys in a row or column do not work, please follow the section on additional diagnostics through the P. Andrew utility, coming up later. If one or a few scattered keys do not work, it is most certainly not a hardware error, but instead a user installation error or debris that entered the keyboard and moved between the flipper and capacitive PCB, thereby interfering with the key press signal. Does the rightmost row of keys get stuck when you press one of them? Sometimes all of the keys on the leftmost or rightmost side may be stuck because they are too close to the case. Things may have shifted in shipping. All you need to do is loosen the four screws on the bottom and slide the mechanism away from the edge it is too close to. And of course, tighten it back up again when done. Check to make sure the inner plates slide in fully so the sides of the tabs touch the sides of the bottom inner assembly, as shown. If there is some space between the tabs, then there could be some issues with keyboard functionality. Also, the top left tab should be folded down a little to lock everything in place. Now we're going to install the solenoid. Just a few safety warnings to start out. It is very easy to permanently damage the solenoid and driver by not following all of the instructions. Also, if your solenoid does not work after installing it, you may need to update the firmware, as a recent bug prevented the solenoid from working. Most importantly, do not over tighten the screw that attaches the L bracket to your keyboard case, or it might puncture the solenoid the solenoid and required solenoid driver are optional add-on products not included with any keyboard. There is a built-in keyboard shortcut to easily turn on and off the solenoid, so you don't have to keep the solenoid on all the time if you have one. Please see the link in the description to order the solenoid. Most important is to match the square on both sides of the ribbon cable connector. Please make sure that the red wire goes to the square pad on both the controller and the solenoid driver we open up the keyboard. Then we want to connect the cable as shown. The red wire goes to the square pad on the controller and the solenoid driver. Please make sure you connect the cable as shown, as you may cause damage if the cables are connected another way. The solenoid connector can be plugged in either direction on the solenoid driver. Use the included mounting kit to install the solenoid. The solenoid driver can be placed in the empty space between the controller and solenoid. Consult the manual for other models which may have a different mounting point for the solenoid driver. Unscrew the two screws on the solenoid to maximize the solenoid throw length. Retighten these screws when you're done expanding the throw distance. Install the screw and rubber washer to the hole in the bottom hole of the case that is opposite the controller. For models other than the F77 and F62, please note that the installation process may be different, so please consult the written manual on the project website for additional information. Install the second washer on the other side, as pictured here. 
Next up, attach the L bracket as shown. Be sure to attach it so that the bracket is on the same side as the black and white wires. As a note, with some new Model F keyboards, the bracket may not be used and you may be installing the solenoid directly onto the bottom of the case without using the L bracket. Screw in the solenoid as oriented in this photo. The hole for the screw is on the L bracket that you previously attached to the solenoid. You are now finished with the solenoid after closing up the case. If the solenoid does not work, be sure to flash the latest firmware available on modelfkeyboards.com slash manual. Here's the solenoid in action, with the bracket fully extended to show the full force of the solenoid. Due to factory default QMK settings, the solenoid will only be under full power if the dwell time is set properly. This is done for you automatically if you are using the default firmware that came with your keyboard, or any of my hex files. However, if you use the QMK configurator website to make your firmware, you will need to follow some additional steps to increase the dwell time before your solenoid can function. Okay, and that's it, you've installed your solenoid. Okay, now we are going to use the PAndrew utility to diagnose issues with many keys. This utility is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. With the keyboard in its normal horizontal position, and with all keys properly installed and tested, plug in the keyboard, load the utility program, and click Signal Level Monitor. Then remove the keys at issue using your wire key puller. Use your fingers to move the spring to make sure it moves freely and make sure the flipper is not stuck. The flippers would then freely make contact with the PCB. If you see the middle number of the three numbers for each key being a solid green when the flipper is left alone, very close in numerical value to the bottom number for that key, that means there's an issue with the installation of the key or of the spring. See if the flipper moves freely and the middle values change when the key is removed if you rotate the keyboard vertical, spacebar side up, and then flat. Here's how the matrix should look in the QMK utility after you have pressed each key one time and opened up the signal level monitor window in the PAndrew utility program. The keys that stay red represent pads without flippers, which may vary based on your layout. If the middle row changes to green without an installed key, that means you need to adjust the spring by following all the steps detailed earlier. Removing and reseating the key again and again without doing anything else is unlikely to fix this problem. If you see something like this example, indicating a bad matrix row, then you'll need to do some touching up of the solder. As you can see, the traces in the keyboard controller matrix do not correspond to actual rows of keys. Now switch to the matrix view. In the matrix view, you may see three press signals. These are not actual keys that are pressed. There may be one key in the 16th column for F62 and F77 keyboards, the bottom right physical key on the keyboard. With this view, you can more easily see if a row or column is damaged. If many keys read zero for the value, then there is possibly a short to ground, and it is best to add a couple layers of insulating tape to the bottom of the controller where the ribbon cables are. Polyamide or Kapton tape, electrical tape, etc. This is more likely to happen to the ultra compact cases as they are bounced around in shipping, and the ribbon cable may break through the factory installed tape and contact the keyboard case bottom. Sometimes the ribbon cable wire has broken through this tape and is touching the case. In this situation, you would see the problem go away when the keyboard inner assembly is outside of the case. While the controller is installed and the keyboard is upside down with supports on either side, such as a book or a block of wood, so that the keys do not get pressed, push down on the part below the controller with the ribbon cable, so that the ribbon cable end of the controller moves a little closer to the bottom inner assembly plate, so as to move it away from making contact with the bottom of the case. If the row or column reads a value higher than zero, for example 110, but does not respond to key presses, then maybe the rower column needs more solder applied to the through hole on the controller and or on the capacitive PCB. This also unfortunately does happen after these keyboards are bounced around in shipping. But the good thing is you don't have to open up the inner assembly at this time. It is rare as I confirm each column and row before shipping, but it has been documented. The controller is fine. You just need to add more solder to the holes for the ribbon connections for the column at issue on the PCB side of the components. 
Just make sure you don't touch any of the components themselves with solder. No need to add solder on any of the other connections unless the connection looks like it needs more solder. If the right control on F62 or the right arrow key on the F77, the bottom right keys, is not registering in the P-Andrew utility with the key removed, that usually means that column 16 needs to be retouched. These keys are special in that only one key is in column 16. Some folks think that the key is broken because it does not register as control when pressed, but did not read the product page, which notes this key is factory programmed to function for some layouts. How do you find out which column or row needs more solder? You can see the traces where the keys that don't work are located. For example, left alt, right alt, V, spacebar, M, the key between right alt and right control, and right control are all on the same trace, even though they are not on the same physical row. You can follow the line in the image and see that they are all connected to the leftmost trace, which is connected to the third through hole from the left. So that would be the area to touch up. You need to add solder from the side of the controller components not the bottom of the controller. Just unscrew the two controller screws and gently bend the controller back as shown here. You should also carefully add solder to the other end of the ribbon cable corresponding to that same wire. You should not open up the inner assembly for this procedure. You should add solder from the side that you can see and access already. Only if there is still a problem after following these steps and retesting should you open up the inner assembly and remove the large capacitive PCB to inspect for shorts. Do two keys press when you press one key? Occasionally, there will be a solder bridge connecting two rows or columns together, either somewhere on the PCB or the 30 through holes at the top of the board. Just remove the bridged material carefully and then all will be well. Most likely the bridge is on either end of the ribbon cable wires, but occasionally it is on the large capacitive PCB itself as shown here. Another example, if the keys 2, Q, W, A, S, Z, X and left alt do not work, then the second grouping of columns in the matrix should be looked at. You can see that the 14th through hole from the left connects to the column that includes all those keys. So you would solder that through hole on both the front side of the controller, unscrew the controller, and if that doesn't solve the issue, also add some solder to the accessible part of the large capacitive PCB. You don't have to take apart the keyboard for this. Just add some solder from the bottom side that you can still access with the inner assembly upside down. Okay, now we're on to intermediate topics, including firmware, keyboard disassembly, and changing cases. First up is how to open up the keyboard inner assembly and how to change your case style. First, make sure all the keys are removed from the keyboard before opening up the inner assembly. When you're using the screwdriver, make sure to apply enough pressure on each screw so that the screws are not stripped. Once the inner assembly is opened, you can make some layout changes by opening up the inner assembly and moving flippers around so they correspond with the layout that you want. For example, you can change from ISO to ANSI or vice versa, split or unsplit the backspace, or you could split or unsplit the backspace left shift, right shift, enter, and spacebar. You probably want to bend the larger top inner assembly tabs outwards a bit before clamping down, as this may make the case easier to close. Okay, now here are the steps for opening up the keyboard. First, remove all the keys. Use supports on each side to make sure the flippers do not touch your desk when upside down. Then, bend the tab closest to the controller outwards slightly so that it clears the bottom plate. Next, use tongue and groove pliers to slide the plates apart. You can also use a hammer to tap the top inner assembly plate. Then use a lint-free cloth to wipe the capacitive PCB surface if needed. With the keyboard plugged in and the software open, you can also test problematic keys by placing a flipper precisely on top of the PCB pad or replacing the flipper and spring entirely. Try replacing or switching a problematic flipper and spring. Now onto closing the assembly. First. Before you close up the inner assembly, make sure all those flippers are in their proper positions and that none are stuck. For the larger tabs, you should all bend back each of them a little bit so that the bottom inner assembly plate can go back in more easily. Push the bottom plate in the lower tabs of the top plate, opposite the spacebar. Then use your pliers to press the top edge tabs. They should snap together. I recommend a second pair of pliers to bend a tab back into place afterwards, as shown. For that last tab, you want to fold that tab all the way back so that it locks the inner assembly mechanism back into place. 
Okay, then you want to inspect the tabs to make sure the assembly is correctly aligned. In this photo, there is a gap between the tab and the bottom plate, which will cause problems later. There should be no gap between the top and bottom inner assembly's interlocking tabs. You can also change cases. To change from the larger case to the smaller case, or vice versa, you would remove the keys, open up the keyboard case and bottom inner assembly while keeping the keyboard upside down, and then switch to the alternative bottom inner assembly metal plate. Unfortunately, you can't change the HHKB style split right shift to the standard right shift, or vice versa, unless you purchase another PCB, top inner assembly, and inner foam, as the keys are in a slightly different physical location. Okay, now we're on to intermediate level firmware adjustment. Please check out the manual for full details on how to adjust the firmware. If you're having trouble entering the bootloader mode, you may have to physically short the prog connector on your controller. To do this, you would unscrew the two controller screws to see the component side of the board, and then make a connection with a conductive metal object like an uncoated metal paper clip or tweezers. Then you would connect the USB cable to the controller and within a split second, remove the paper clip. There may be some oxidation on top of this pad, so you may have to dig in a little into the pad to break up the surface oxidation and make sure that you are actually shorting the prog connection. You may have to try a few times to get it into bootloader mode. Okay, now let's say you want to put new firmware onto your controller. If this is the first time loading firmware to your keyboard, you will need to follow the steps if you don't follow them, you may get an error atlibusbdfu.dll not found. First up, you want to enter the bootloader mode by pressing left shift, right shift, and B if running QMK or VIA, or using the pandrew utility and clicking the enter bootloader button. For your first time loading firmware, this is what you should see in your Windows device manager. If not, then your device is not yet in bootloader mode and you'll need to try a few more times to get it into bootloader mode. Now you want to install Atmel Flip. Please see the description for more details. In Device Manager, right click the Atmel device and click Update Driver. Then click Browse My Computer. Click Browse and browse to the installed location of your Atmel software. Make sure Include Subfolders is checked. If you can see Atmega32U2 in the Device Manager, this indicates a successful install. Don't proceed unless all steps are successful. And you can see this in your device manager. If you do not correctly go into bootloader mode, you will see either IBM CapSense USB or Model F Labs keyboard in your devices and printers menu. This is not good at this stage because you can't proceed. So go back and try again to make sure that you are in bootloader mode. If you enter the bootloader mode correctly, you will see at mega 32 u 2 dfu in your unspecified section of the devices and printers page. Only if you see this can you proceed. Next up, we can open the program at Mel Flip. Click the chip icon to select a target device, pick at Mega 32U2 and click OK. Then click the USB icon and click USB. Then click Open, File, Load Hex File, Load the file eeprom eraser.hex. This file erases all the configuration options and firmware. Normal firmware updates do not erase these options. You want a full erasure. Then click run and wait for it to finish. After this step, disconnect the USB cable from your controller, wait 10 seconds, and then plug it back in. Then click the USB picture, click USB, click open like you did before, and load the hex firmware that you want. Then select the firmware hex file you want to use. As a note, I have many pre-made hex firmware files available in a zip file in the description below. Make sure you see the name of the QMK or XWhatsit hex file in blue. If not, you may have to load the file again. Then click run and wait for it to finish. Disconnect the USB cable, wait 10 seconds, then plug it back in. You should now see brand new Model F keyboards, IBM CapSense USB, or something similar in the devices and printers window. If not, and you still see at Mega 32 u 2 go back to the Atmel Flip and redo the steps again. Currently, there are three main firmware options. First up is QMK. QMK is the easiest option and is also the factory default option. If you just want to switch the right side block or go back to the various stock firmware options, flash the desired firmware hex file. No need to follow most of these other steps. Currently, the Beta QMK configurator is the only one that will work with Model F keyboards, though this may change in the future. Please check the description for the latest details. 
The next option is VIA or VIAL. These are GUI programs that you can run offline to adjust your keyboard. VIA is the closed source version and VIAL is the open source version. Please direct all firmware questions to the project thread on the DeskThority forum. You can see VIA Model F documentation provided in the links in the description. There is also a step-by-step -step guide on flashing VIAL linked to in the description. An important note for VIA is that you'll need to select a firmware labeled 0 to 9 if you plan on assigning keys to the blank keys in the print screen right side block layout. Unfortunately, there is a bug where if you pick any layout labeled print screen, you cannot assign these two keys later on because they were not initially assigned. The final option is the original XWhatsApp firmware, introduced many years ago. It is now deprecated in favor of the newer firmware. And also there are some additional firmware options currently in development, including some posted by DeskThority users on the project thread. Okay, now this part of the video will show you how to update the layout and firmware of any Model F keyboard with an XWhatsApp controller. We're going to show two great firmware options, QMK and VIA. Additional details are in the manual on the project website. Everything is done from a website. For firmware flashing, I like Atmel Flip. Links to all the files are in the description below. VIA is the latest firmware offering. It allows for completely offline layout adjustments done in a free software program. With VIA, there's no need to rely on a website to adjust the layout. If you're just looking to do something simple like change your right side block from print screen to the 0 to 9 number pad option, all you have to do is flash the appropriate hex file for your layout. You don't have to do any of the firmware generation steps on the QMK website or with the VIA program. You can go directly to flashing with the Atmel Flip or equivalent program for your operating system. For example, for F77, with the HHKB style split right shift and regular 2U backspace, you would just enter the bootloader and flash either of these two firmware options using Atmel Flip or the equivalent software. In this first part of the video, we will reconfigure our layout using the QMK website. As a note, you have to go to a specific website. At the moment, QMK Model F is in beta and is not yet integrated with the main QMK project. The links are in the description below. After going to the QMK beta website, we download the QMK layout file zip file from the Model F keyboard's project website. And we also download Atmel Flip, a free program. Next, we click the button immediately to the right of the keymap.json green button. After clicking the load JSON button on the QMK website, browse to the QMK layout zip file. Extract the files to a folder. Now we are going to pick a JSON template file to start out with so we don't have to start from scratch. All available files are in the QMK layout zip file in the description. You may need to enable the viewing of extensions in your operating system. Now which file should we pick? If unsure about the layout naming, feel free to refer to the dot matrix packing slip or your order confirmation email. Now we have loaded the JSON template file and can start making changes. Coming up you can see how easy it is to change a key. Just click the key you want to add, and then drag it to the keyboard position where you want the key. In the example coming up, I drag the caps lock key to the key just below the tab key, and then I drag the control key to the bottom right key. I also click the X in the top right corner of a keyboard key to remove the assignment for that key. Now onto customizing the function layers. Here is the factory default function layer for your reference. For example, pressing function and one sends the F1 key to the computer. Pressing function and D will send the mute command to the computer. Up next, I will show you how to change the keys on the other layers. The XWhatsApp controller allows for several layers of keys, meaning you can press and hold the function key on the keyboard and press another key, and it will activate another key or key combination. Here is the factory default key function, HPT TOG, which can toggle your solenoid on and off. You would not have to add this as it's already included by default. Just press function, spacebar, and T to toggle your solenoid on and off. Now that I'm done making layout changes, I will scroll up to the top of the web page and click the button on the top right, Compile. After the website compiles the firmware for you, click the Download Firmware button. Next, we need to flash the firmware onto the XWhatsApp controller. I like to use Atmel Flip, link to in the description. Before we flash the firmware, the keyboard needs to be in bootloader mode, which means it is ready to accept new firmware. The default firmware is QMK at the moment. 
With QMK, you can use the pandrew utility and enter the bootloader with one click. If you flashed VIA onto your board, the pandrew utility currently will not work, so you should stay tuned. Later in this video, you will see the different ways to get your keyboard to the bootloader mode. Open the pandrew utility. Once you plug in the keyboard, you will see a line appear in the utility. Always erase the EEPROM before loading any firmware. If QMK, the factory default firmware, is your current firmware, you can use the pandrew tool. If you currently have VIA firmware, I recommend flashing the EEPROM eraser.hex firmware using AtmelFlip or another program for your operating system. This hex file can be found in that same zip file mentioned before. Now we can click Enter Bootloader. The keyboard will then disappear from the pandrew program once you click the Enter Bootloader button. You are now ready to use your flashing program to flash the new firmware. Follow my selections and actions exactly in the coming steps. Select at Mega 32U2 and not another chip. And don't forget to click the USB icon and click open to open the USB port connection. Click file, load hex file, pick the hex file you want and click run. That's it. Don't forget to unplug and plug back in your keyboard after flashing any firmware. Otherwise it won't be recognized as a keyboard because it's in bootloader mode until you unplug it and plug it back in. If there's a problem with your QMK firmware, it's easy to start again. Use the pandrew utility to enter the bootloader mode with one click. Or use the key combination to enter the bootloader mode if you're on VIA. Now we can have a little fun with the pandrew program if you want to run a diagnostic test and make sure each key is recognized by the controller. The button is called signal level monitor. All I'm doing is clicking the button to open the monitor and then clicking one key at a time, holding each key for about one to two seconds. As noted earlier, unplug and plug back in the keyboard to get the keyboard out of bootloader mode after you have flashed a firmware file. Now onto interpreting the results of the signal level monitor. With no keys pressed, all rectangles are green. After the first key is pressed, the other boxes all turn pink. While pressing a key, you can see that the middle number in each group of rectangles for each key turns green and the number changes significantly. If there's no reaction, some troubleshooting is needed. I am now pressing keys on the keyboard. Each tested key registers in the utility. Close out the signal level monitor when you're finished. Otherwise, keys will not register with your computer when you press them. If you are using the QMK website option, just press function, spacebar, and the plus key next to the backspace 20 to 25 times to increase the dwell time so that the solenoid functions at maximum force. Please note that this is just for the keys in that top row, not for the keys in your number pad. Those keys have not been factory pre-programmed to adjust the dwell time of the solenoids. This is only needed if you use the Beta QMK Configurator website to generate your own firmware. We are completely done with customizing QMK. Now it's time to show you how easy it is to load and start working with VIA. If you're using the VIA or QMK firmware in the zip file from my website, I have already pre-programmed the best settings to operate your solenoid driver and solenoid. Always erase the EEPROM before loading any firmware. If QMK, the factory default firmware, is the current firmware, you can use the pandrew tool, linked to in the description. If you currently have VIA firmware, I recommend entering the bootloader mode with a key command and flashing the EEPROM eraser hex firmware. This hex file can be found in that same zip file, QMK layout files. To load VIA, the first step is to load one of the pre-programmed hex files as a starting point. The file names all start with VIA. These files can be found in the same zip file for QMK files that we downloaded before. File name is QMK layout files, Zip. For example, if I had an F77 with the HHKB style split right shift and split backspace, I would choose one of the firmware files noted here. And please do choose the 0 to 9 firmware if you plan on assigning key buttons to the keys to the left and right of that up cursor arrow because of a bug with the VIA software. After the custom VIA firmware is flashed, Unplug the keyboard and plug it back in so that we exit the bootloader mode and go back into the regular keyboard mode. Otherwise, your computer will not detect the keyboard. Then, we open the VIA program. As a note, VIA will not detect the keyboard until we load a special VIA JSON file into VIA. Other JSON layout files will not work. You will see the Searching for Devices screen for the time being. Next, we click the Settings tab in VIA and then select Show Design tab. The selection should turn red. 
Then we will go into the Design tab in VIA, where we will now be loading the special JSON file that allows VIA to detect the Model F keyboard with Xwatsik controller. This file kind of resets the programmed layout we loaded before, so that some extra work may be needed to customize your Model F in VIA. We are going to click the Load button, then select the, quote, VIA program, load this if you have the F77, JSON, if we have any F77 type keyboard. Or select the VIA program, load this if you have the F62.json, if we have any variation of the F62 keyboard. Now the VIA program detects the keyboard. You can see that the keys can be configured when you click the Configure tab at the top of the VIA program. The VIA default layout may not match the configuration of your keyboard. Maybe you have the HHKB style split right shift, and VIA shows that you have a standard right shift. First, we will want to change the keyboard layout so that it matches the physical layout of your keyboard. The great thing about the Model F is every keyboard has the pads, so you can split the backspace, spacebar, enter, left shift, and right shift keys. The only limitation is that the HHKB style split right shift won't accept a regular size right shift key and vice versa, and the standard ANSI slash ISO won't accept a 1.75U and 1U right shift area arrangement of keys. Though, you can split a regular right shift key the other way, 1U and 1.75U, like on the JIS layout. In one way, VIA is kind of the opposite of the QMK configurator website. Instead of dragging the key you want to the position on the keyboard, as you would do with QMK, in VIA, you click the key on the F77 or F62 that you want to change, and then you click the key in the bottom section of keys that you want that key to be changed to. Let's change that bottom left key to left control. It has been updated. No need to save anything, as VIA automatically saves each change to the controller inside the keyboard. And now, we adjust the additional layers. Click a layer, like 1, 2, or 3, to view the current layout assignments for that layout. Things start with layer 0 as the base layer. Layer 1 is kind of the second layer. For more details on how much you can do with VIA and QMK, consult the manual on the project website, as well as the documentation specific to those firmwares. Let's add a play key to the function layer, right next to the eject key. So now, if we press function and G, it will send the play keyboard command to the computer. Here, I'm just testing some keys to show how VIA detects the key presses. The default key combinations to enter bootloader with VIA firmware is function, spacebar, and R, Alternatively, you can try left shift and right shift and B. However, there's an easy way to enter the bootloader in VIA without having to memorize key combinations. Just temporarily assign a key to be reset, which is a key found in the special section of keys. Just click special in the VIA program window. Click the bottom left key, for example, then click reset to assign that bottom key on your keyboard to be reset. Pressing the reset key on your keyboard will now instantly put your keyboard into bootloader mode. This can be helpful if one of the keys for the key combination required to enter bootloader mode is not working. Okay, so that's all for VIA. And that's all for intermediate firmware adjustment. And now we're just into the appendix to wrap things up. First up is Model F cleaning. There are many Model F cleaning videos that you can find online. Always keep your keyboard unplugged during cleaning and while things are drying. Always let your keycaps air dry overnight with a good amount of airflow in a non-humid place. Never reinstall keycaps after only a few hours of drying as there will still be some small droplets inside the keycaps that will interfere with keyboard operation later on. Throughout the drying process, I recommend shaking all the keys in a towel and shaking each key individually to get the water out of each key. Mild soap and lukewarm water is recommended. I clean my Model F and Model M keys and barrels but not springs and flippers in an ultrasonic cleaner. I almost never clean the flippers and springs unless there is a residue that cannot be removed with a dry cloth. A fan blowing on the keys, all on a large towel, works well. Sometimes, if the keys are very dirty, I will clean each key and the keyboard case carefully with a melamine foam sponge. Be careful, as this might take the paint right off or cause other damage. Be careful not to get the controller wet or you may damage it. For liquid spills, you want to take apart the keyboard and clean it out. You probably have to scrub each flipper and the large capacitive PCB with soap and water and letting them air dry for a day. 
making sure Liquid does not touch the controller. Here are some other mods that some people have done to their keyboards. These mods are not recommended officially. The floss mod involves putting a specific type of dental floss inside the spring of each key to reduce the ringing sound of the keys as you type. As some folks prefer the Model F without the ringing sound or need the Model F to be used in a quieter environment. Check out the manual for additional links and resources. In addition to the floss mod, there are also mods to add a track point to your Model F keyboard. Another mod to consider is the grease mod. The purpose of the grease mod is also to reduce the reverberation or ringing after each key is pressed. More details are in the manual.